Hi. Good evening. Welcome to The Point of View. The Point of View is your favorite current affairs program on television. On The Point of View, we select the right topic, get the right guests, ask relevant questions, and often leave you with insights. Tonight, we have a big, big discussion with a table full of technocrats. We are looking at Ghana's road to economic recovery. Um, on Tuesday, uh, the Minister of Finance and the IMF team announced that Ghana has reached or, had, or has reached uh, a staff level agreement with the IMF. What is a staff level agreement really? What does it mean? Is it an irreversible stage in the process? Can anything go wrong from here? And what does this mean to Ghana's road to economic recovery? How long is it going to take before we get back to where we were previously? These are matters that will be seeking some education and insights uh, on from our guests. Um, you can join a discussion as always on 055058532 and uh, just drop your comments and we'll read them out to the rest of you. If you have questions, send those questions through. Uh, we will ask our guests to help us appreciate the issues properly. Um, it's, it's, it's a discussion of technocrats tonight. My name is Salom Adonu, sitting in for a regular host, Bernard Koku Able. Once again, you're welcome. I'll return, introduce my guest, and then we'll get a discussion underway. You're welcome back to the point of view. Uh, tonight, we're having a discussion on Ghana's road to economic recovery. Uh, government and the IMF yesterday or on Tuesday announced that the two sides have reached a staff level agreement. And so what it means is that, you know, we have to ensure that our debt operation works well so that we can also uh, achieve or get to the management and board level agreement to clinch a deal and the deal is worth three billion dollars over a three-year period we'll understand what all of these mean tonight also earlier in the day uh, the imf uh, the chief of the imf mission stefan roder uh, spoke to my colleagues on the city breakfast show today Let, let's listen to a brief part of that interview we'll get back to the studio and then i'll do the introduction of my guests and we'll get a discussion on the way July 1, when our president announced the intention, at what point did the staff come in? At what point did your work begin? We, we, we started very quickly after the, the request from the, from the authorities. Uh, we, we were able to, to send to, to Accra from Washington a uh, mission very, very soon after the request. And really, I have to say, since then, we have engaged very, very, very closely with, uh, with the Ghanaian authorities. You know, we, we, we engage with a number of uh, institutions, with mm -hmm. uh, uh, other uh, ministries, with, uh, you know, par Parliament, the Finance Committee. Mm -hmm. um, but we also engage with, with other stakeholders, uh, mm -hmm. civil society, uh, um, unions, mm -hmm. representatives of the private sector. It's very important for us to, to get a sense of what is really happening on the ground. We know that Ghana had balance of payment problems, and it was said that before the IMF would lend money to us, we had to do a debt sustainability analysis. What does that mean? Well, for, for, the, for the IMF to be able to lend to, to, to a country, uh, it is very important uh, for the institution to be uh, comfortable and, and make sure that debt is going to be sustainable. Uh, going forward, uh, it means that the government will be able to repay its debt, you know, on a sustainable basis over the the, the, the medium term. Mm. So that's that's really something that is very important for for us to be able to land. And so lots of discussions are about, uh, you know, what type of policies mm. um, need to be to need to be implemented. This is one of the quickest you've arrived at a conclusion at staff level, at least for Ghana's case. It usually takes longer. Is this correct? And if it is, what accounted for this? Um, I think uh, I'd say probably the, the intensity of the engagement that we've had uh, from the very beginning, from, from, from July. Uh, you know, all of these uh, missions, uh, sometimes, um, you know, you, people in Ghana, they don't necessarily see that this is uh, delivering because there is nothing to announce at the end of a, of a mission. But, but the progress that is made in this context in terms of understanding what the challenges are, understanding what the authorities uh, are going to do to, in terms of on the policy front to address these challenges uh, is, is very important. That, that's what allowed us to, to, to make progress uh, rapidly. Is there a sense that the general leadership of the IMF beyond the staff 
really want to do this? I'm asking because I remember in Washington, the IMF uh, managing director was very clear. She said in Ghana needs help from the IMF. She says our programs are caused by our problems are caused by COVID and the Russia Ukraine crisis. She sort of sent some signal. Even a couple of days ago, we heard the U.S. embassy, U.S. ambassador say that if Ghana gets a staff level agreement, the U.S. will support at the board level. Is there a sense in Washington that even before your work, there was some eagerness, possibly because of the geopolitical situation in the sub-region, that they can't allow Ghana to get to the brink of, say, Sri Lanka, so they have to do something? Well, the short answer is yes. Uh, there is some eagerness to, to, to help Ghana, of course. Um, Everybody is well aware of the, the hardship that the people of Ghana are, are experiencing these days, and, and it is very important for, for, you know, for, for, for us to help in this, in, in, in this context. All right, so you heard Stefan Rudev there, who is the, uh, the, the mission chief of the IMF team that visited Ghana. And together with Colonel Furata yesterday, they announced that Ghana had reached a staff level agreement with the fund. Tonight, um, my guests are Dr. Philip Abredu Otu, who is the Director of Research at the Bank of Ghana. Doc, you're welcome. I also have Dr. Lahassan Idrisu, who is a macro stroke development economist at the Ministry of Finance. Doc, welcome. I also have Samuel Akes, who is a Director of Treasury and Debt Management Division of the Ministry of Finance. Um, Sam, you're welcome. Thank you. All right. Um, in, in the last few days, uh, I mean, we, we've, we've, we've heard quite a bit from you, Sam, uh, because you are the director of debt. That's how the finance minister calls you. Direct. <laughs> the, the first time I heard your title, I said, wow, director of debt. You know, so, um, and, and you, you've, you've made quite a few statements trying to clarify the position, etc. You know, we have been told by the finance minister that Ghana has become a high, you know, debt distressed country. You know, our debt from the debt sustainability analysis you know, have been seen to be unsustainable. The question is, you know, at what point did we realize that our debts uh, became or have become sustain unsustainable? Right, thank you very much. Um, I will just draw your attention to, I think, over the past three years. If, well, if you take a look at any of the IMF um, write-ups on Ghana, mm. or you take any of the budget statements, you would have seen a debt sustainability section in there. Mm and you would have realized that um, the outcome was a high debt distress. Mm. But then the only difference is that um, in the previous year, it was high debt distress, but sustainable in terms of the outlook. Okay. In this case, it's high debt distress, but unsustainable in terms of the outlook. Mm. So that is the difference. Okay. So what, what will you attribute the unsustainability, unsustainable nature of that to? You know, to what extent will you say COVID and the Ukraine war you know, uh, would have contributed to that? Well, let me use, um, this is a technical question you were asking, mm -hmm. and I'll try to also make it as simple sure, as sure. possible. Yes. If you recall, at the end of 2021, mm -hmm. um, December inflation, I think, was around, um, I think about 13%. 91-day mm -hmm. Treasury bill was around 12.6%. And today, we are looking at inflation of about 50%. Mm -hmm. You are looking at depreciation of the currency of about 50 percent. Now when you put that together, you are looking at an economy that has been stressed and there's a very high volatile macroeconomic instability. Mm. In the economic balance, they call them vulnerability indicators have heightened. Again, there's also two other indicators that are key. The sovereign credit ratings, and we've had um, multiple downgrades from all the three rating mm -hmm. agencies. They command almost 98% of the entire world ratings. So once you are within the sea, um, that shows an indi um, a level of your risk. Mm -hmm. Then you also have another indicator called the spread, which above a thousand basis points is signaling a challenge. Mm -hmm. But at a point, 31st October, for example, it was around 3,400. Mm -hmm. So this never happened in all the years that we had a high debt distress. So when you put that together, and it was continuing, um, I'm sure the inflation you saw it just going up, mm -hmm. it never stabilized along the whole year. Then the outlook would look automatically unsustainable. Mm -hmm. I, I see, D D Dr. Bradwell too. Um, so he talked about inflation, heightening inflation. I mean, inflation growing 50.3 percent, etc. What we often see the Bank of Ghana do is to increase the policy rates. A lot of people have had issues with that. Can you explain to us 
why the Bank of Ghana usually will increase the policy rates as a way of arresting inflation? Well, so thank you very much. Uh, so uh, the inflation story uh, normally comes in many, many forms. Uh, inflation could come from cost push measures, and it could also come from the fact that there is too much inbuilt aggregate demand pressures in the economy, mm. which is, uh, you know, stoking excessive demand for goods and services. Uh, and so when the Bank of Ghana makes a decision, uh, we, we weigh these factors that are impinging on inflation, and we move to attack that portion mm. which is driven by aggregate demand. So we just don't arbitrarily increase interest rates because inflation is going uh, go moving up but we do a breakdown of the inflation factors and then we move to attack the aggregate demand uh, portion to ensure that inflation does not become endemic and systemic but of course yes then the question you'll be asking is well so why have we taken all these actions mm -hmm. and inflation and still inflation is skyrocketing. Still skyrocketing if 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 you look at what has happened this year, mm -hmm. this year has been, uh, well, let me use the word, one of the most brutal years mm -hmm. in terms of factors impinging on inflation. Uh, you've had the RU war, mm -hmm. crude oil prices skyrocketed to 120 US dollars. Uh, you've had exchange rate pressures. My colleague was talking about downgrades. Uh, these exchange rate pressures have fed into, into, into the pricing behavior. Um, at the beginning of the year, we had downgrades somewhere around the first quarter. In May, we had another downgrade. And any time these downgrades come, mm. we see portfolio investors react to, to, to these downgrades, and uh, they tend to prematurely uh, disengage from the economy. So, mm. so, so, so they get out of the economy because of fears that their investments might Whittle away. So, so anytime they do that, and anytime that behavior kicks in, mm -hmm. uh, they need to leave. And when they leave, they leave with dollars. And we need to provide these dollars to these investors anytime they go out. Okay. Remember, when they came, they came in with dollars, dollars. to purchase mm -hmm. our instruments. So when they are uh, going, they must go with dollars. We must find dollars for them. Must find dollars for them. And 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 that puts a lot of pressure on the central bank's mm -hmm. reserves. And when that happens, in, on top of other uh, commitments that the central bank has, it puts on due pressure on the exchange rate. Mm. When the exchange rate moves, there's a pass through to inflation. Uh, the pricing behavior of agents in the economy mm -hmm. is such that everybody keeps looking at what is happening to the exchange rate. And when the exchange rate moves, everybody moves. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a difficult thing. And one way of attacking the exchange rate is also to use the interest rate tool yeah. to address the exchange rate problem. Um, of course, so you need to set the interest rate in such a way that economic agents will have a choice between domestic assets and foreign assets. And one way when we do that uh, is to try to shift uh, attention away from foreign assets mm -hmm. to domestic right. assets to ease the pressure uh, away away from 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 the exchange rate and then spilling into inflation mm. crude oil importation it depends on exchange rate yes. so everything depends on the exchange rate and we need to find that fine balance uh, in trying to manage the expectations and try to tame the pressures that will come on the exchange rate, which invariably then feeds into, into inflation. So the inflation story this year uh, has, been, has, been, has been a very difficult one for, for the central bank. But although we see the year-on-year -year inflation move up, mm -hmm. if you look at the inflation numbers closely, from the beginning of the year, we moved in terms of month-on-month -month inflation, and we peaked. Uh, at a month-on-month -month inflation of 5.1 percent, and this was in May. If you look at the numbers closely, monetary policy was working mm -hmm. because from that peak of a monthly inflation of 5.1 percent, 
we saw a steady marked deceleration in the month-on-month -month inflation rate. That was evidence that the monetary policy uh, hike was working and uh, it served to constrain the month-on-month -month growth. Mm -hmm. So it decelerated all the way to 1.9%. And then in September, October, just when we thought that this would continue to decelerate, other forms of shocks also came in. In September, we saw transport fares kick up again. Mm -hmm. uh, there were utility. Mm -hmm. And September was when the exchange rate also started mounting mm -hmm. pressure. The multiplicity of multiplicity factors, of factors yeah. kicked in. And then again, there was a Bloomberg story which said mm -hmm. there was going to be a haircut. Mm -hmm. I think that was the biggest thing that happened, um, a 30% haircut. Uh, and that also sent some jitters into the market. Mm -hmm. And we saw uh, investors, both domestic and external, react alike. Everybody moving to the dollar uh, for, 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 for safe haven uh, status. Mm -hmm. uh, that put pressure on the city. And in the month of October alone, in the month of October alone, the currency depreciated by 28%. But that is brutal. Mm -hmm. And when you see an exchange rate of that magnitude, the next thing is that it spills into inflation. Mm -hmm. So the inflation number we are seeing in, uh, uh, in November, uh, uh, I think it's, it's, it's expected. It was expected, given the, the level of depreciation that we saw in, in October. Inflation has just moved to 50.3%. Uh, you recall in our MPC press statement, we did indicate that <laughs> inflation will continue to rise. rise. And then we did say that we expected inflation to peak somewhere in the first quarter of 2023. Because we had factored in all these do, do, events. Do you, have, do, you have, um, uh, do you have a sense of what that peak inf inflation <laughs> figure will be? Well, I do. We do, but I, I, we can't talk about that peak here. <laughs> All right. So, so uh, in terms of inflation, we can't talk uh, about that peak here. Toby Afed, I think he was on your board some time back. Yeah. He authored uh, a document recently, yeah. where he, he, of course, he said it's something he's been saying since two thousand and three. Yeah. Having issue with how we deal with how the Bank of Ghana looks at inflation, looking at it from a historical point of view, rather than it being, you know, an expected inflation. I don't know if you have any thoughts on, on some of these things he's been saying in terms of how you factor that into your policy making. No, so our inflation targeting framework is forward looking. Mm. Uh, and anytime we set interest rates, we don't set interest rates based on previous inflation, mm. but we set the interest rates looking at an inflation horizon over uh, a year. Mm -hmm. So uh, we see that inflation. Uh, maybe in a year's time will be around 25 mm percent -hmm. we set interest rate based on that one year forecast of inflation uh, so the togbi afedi uh, issue he has a point um I, I recall at a time when he was on the board of the central bank uh, he kept saying that we needed to set policy based on the monthly rate of inflation. inflation. So he was even at that time saying that, look, don't do the year on year, because if you look at the year on year, uh, you might set high interest rates, which mm. will kill the economy. Just look at the monthly, which is an inflation of where we peaked, we peaked at 5.1. Set policy, set your interest rate based on this monthly uh, inflation rate. But that has its own uh, pitfalls as well. He, he, he actually thinks that the Bank of Ghana is to take some of the blame when we complain about the difficulties with the structure of our economy in the sense that you know you make it difficult for local manufacturers to get credit because of how you, you do your, your, your targeting. So credit becomes so expensive, the local guys are unable to get credit, so it's easier to import from China and other places and so it doesn't really help you know in economic growth, it doesn't help our economy to grow. So we are still stuck with this same import-driven economy, which has become the bane of, 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 of everything we do in Ghana, but that's fine. So so um, let, let me come to Doc, Doc Idrisu. Yeah. The issue about COVID and now, you know, are you war? This is the first time I'm hearing are you war. We say Russia, Ukraine war. You know, are you? Um, um, COVID and the are you war. That's right. To what extent 
is this you know affecting us or to, to what extent is this a problem to us indeed it's a problem but people think that putting everything or blaming everything on russia ukraine and covid is is, is not being it's, it's been disingenuous really because there were telltale signs from the beginning we failed to look at those so i mean you are a technical person to what extent is covid or will you blame covid and the RU war for our current predicament all right thank you so much um and let me say a good evening to all the um, listeners and viewers of this program. This is a very important question. Um, the straightforward answer to the question is that the current economic challenges which is facing the country, um, which um, has been announced by His Excellency the President as the country being in economic crisis, um, it's largely as a result of external shocks, but it's also because as a result of um, some development in the domestic economy. Mm. Um, so if you take the external, for example, I mean, we just recovered from, um, or we're recovering from COVID. Um, from 2020, COVID hit the economy very hard. Um, not just Ghana, the whole globe. Um, we saw Ghana register a very low growth rate of 0.5% as a result of uh, COVID. And then we started the recovery process in 2021. We recovered growth. I mean, we recorded a growth of 5.4%. Then comes the um, Russia-Ukraine war, mm -hmm. as my colleague uh, mentioned. Uh, if you recall, when we did the 2022 budget, we actually hadn't factored in the impact of the Russia-Ukraine war. Mm -hmm. So during the media review, we actually had to revise the budget to reflect that. And when we did reflect the impact of um, Russia-Ukraine war, we had to downgrade growth for 2022 to 3.5%. Yeah, so that's, those are the current numbers uh, we are looking at. And they affect the economy in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, so one, um, there are supply disruptions as a result of these um, external shocks. And we all know what that means. So what that means is that when uh, goods and services that um, hitherto were importing into the country, like crude oil, et cetera, um, you know, easily, because of these interventions, they become very difficult to even get. Uh, so we have supply issues and all that. Um, but if I could just dwell on the global factor a bit, in addition to the direct impact of the COVID-19 and then the Russia-Ukraine war, we're also seeing the global economy experiencing new high, heights. Mm. And when I say new highs, we saw that in inflation, we saw that in global interest rates, we saw that in financing conditions, we are seeing that in crude oil prices and all that. What does this mean? For the first time in many years, we've seen global inflation peak up to like, I mean, in 40 years, mm. global inflation peak around 11% thereabout. Um, we've seen interest rate hikes um, many, many times, and this has moved global interest rates. Uh, for example, if you talk about UK, for example, as by the end of October 2022, um, we've seen the, the um, UK um, rate increase uh, to 3%. We've seen the EU's marginal rate increase to 2.3%. We've seen the US federal funds rate increase to 3.1%. Um, and we all know that these advanced countries usually have interest rates which are around 0. Point something percent. Mm -hmm. So you can see the impact. I mean, inflation, um, we are looking at UK inflation hovering around 7.7%, sorry, 11.1% at the end of October. We are looking at um, US inflation around 7.7% and EU at 10.6%. And mm -hmm. we all know that these countries usually will be observing inflation around 2% and all that. Then we have um, the impact of um, the tightened global financing conditions. As my colleague mentioned, I mean, in the global environment or the global um, uh, arena uh, where we would usually go and pick euro bonds um, at reasonably good rates. Mm -hmm. um, the conditions were so tightened as a result of these international um, shocks or global shocks that I mentioned uh, that as we speak today, Ghana is shut um, down completely from these um, external markets. So even if you want to go and pick money from the euro bond markets, it's not the money is not available for you because of the 
um, the kind of conditions that you are experiencing. But that's also so for the domestic economy. Mm -hmm. I mean, until recently, we go to the domestic market to pick money. Um, we experienced auction shortfalls and all that. And it's because of the multiplicity of the issues my colleagues mentioned. So that's the global side. And if you come to the domestic side, um, of course, my colleagues have already mentioned the impact of the credit, multiple credit rating downgrades that yeah. the, uh, Ghana has gone through. Um, we've seen the high interest rates that we, have, we, we are witnessing. I mean, treasury bill rates were around 14% or thereabouts uh, some few um, months ago, or let's say a year ago. But today we are looking at treasury bill rates in the vicinity of 30 something percent. It's very high at all standards. Uh, depreciation of the city, as my colleague mentioned, year to date was just until recently, some few days ago, it was just about 50 something percent. Mm -hmm. Now it's moved down to 42 uh, percent or so. Um, as a result of a number of uh, factors that we are witnessing. Um, we also have one of the domestic issues which I believe also affected the economy um, was the impasse we had in Parliament with regards to the passage of the 2022 uh, budget. budget. You recall that it took a long time for the measures that were proposed in the budget the to be ELV. passed. The ELV, not only the ELV, in fact the ELV, almost all the measures took some time to pass. Mm. Um, so when that happens, so what that means is that no, we which, have a budget. The, the budget itself yes. first was purportedly rejected and it was yeah. reinstated. Yeah. And so that passed before the year ended, I, I guess. Yeah, you know, when the budget is put before parliament for approval, mm. parliament usually will grant two approvals. So okay, there's, so a policy, there's a policy approval mm. where the debate is made on the policy and then parliament will approve the policy. And then we'll move to the second phase where the estimate and appropriation will be, will be passed. So the appropriation so stage delayed. Exactly. The appropriation stage delayed. And, um, um, and in fact, the appropriation had to be passed. You know the laws of yes. the country. By the, by the end of the year, you have to have a budget. Otherwise, you will not be able to spend for. Mm -hmm. So I think the sense. compromise parliament came to was that, okay, fine, we'll pass the appropriation. Mm -hmm. But some of the measures that underpin the appropriation um, would, would then have to do that later. So, for example, measures like the E-Levy, um, et cetera, they were delayed, even though the budget was, was passed. Mm -hmm. And the good thing is that the appropriation that is passed uh, is a ceiling. So you can spend up to. Yes. Uh, so depending upon what agreements are reached, then that doesn't breach um, you know, the, the rules. So all of those really um, affected um, the, uh, you know, the condition that the, the country is in. So, Yes, global, global factors have played a key role uh, in putting us where we are, mm -hmm. uh, but also uh, domestic conditions have also, uh, have, also contributed. have also contributed to the issues. Mm -hmm. Very well. So, yeah. so, so this is a point of view. Uh, yeah. We are looking at Ghana's route to economic recovery. I have a team of technocrats from the Bank of Ghana and Ministry of Finance helping us appreciate the issues. We'll take a short break. We'll return and then delve into the matter of the debt exchange program proper and then what that actually means for you and I and, and the economy generally. Don't go away. Did you know that every time you drink red choco, you support 100% sustainably sourced Ghanaian cocoa and give a child access to quality education? Well done. This advert is FDA approved. Finally, anyone can become a household. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> you will flip a real estate gaming platform that allows you to play and stand a chance of winning a house or cash or consolidated yeah! plans, such as savings towards a house. Simple and easy to play. Visit www.yougoflip.com Buy a ticket to enter the game. Wait for the end of the game to enjoy the win. Anyone can win. Flip it or own it. This advertisement has been vetted and approved by the Gaming Commission of Ghana. Play responsible, not for persons below 18 years, and gaming can be addictive.
you're welcome back to the point of view tonight we are looking at ghana's road to economic recovery uh, my guests are dr philip abredu who is the director of research uh, from the bank of ghana uh, dr alasan idrisu macro stroke development economist at the ministry of finance and samuel Akes, who is the director of treasury and debt management division at the ministry of finance they're helping us appreciate what our current economic condition or situation is and so we want to delve into the matter of the debt operation. But before that, um, the exchange rates, or we understand or we see that the city is, is beginning to do well, beginning to appreciate, beginning to do well against a major currency, the dollar especially. Uh, to the extent that uh, we read that the interbank rate is moving around 10 to 11 uh, cities to a dollar. That is quite an improvement from the 14, 15 cities to a dollar we saw weeks ago. But of course, still worse than the 6.5 we saw from the beginning of the year. It means things are clearly, mm. you know, moving towards a certain direction. Mm. Can you help us appreciate why these things work this way? Why the currency seems to be behaving the way it's yes. behaving? Well, l let me start first from 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 the statistics. Mm. Um, if you look at the statistics, and just this evening we we had a glimpse of uh, um, of our trade data. Mm -hmm. for November and if you look at the trade data for November we see a huge compression in imports mm -hmm. now anytime there's an exchange rate overshoot like what we saw mm -hmm. imports tend to go, down. to go down so 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 importers I mean you saw the so reaction is it because importers cannot marshal or get enough dollars to import or why why should so now 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 they will need more cities they need more cities to okay. get that to get, dollar okay. to bring in that okay. good and okay. uh, they have, they that have they don't it. have okay. that sharp adjustment mm -hmm. it takes time I get it. for them to begin mm -hmm. to marshal resources mm -hmm. to begin to import mm -hmm. we saw the importers and their complaints mm -hmm. the city was depreciating too much it's hurting them we need to close down mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it's part of the story yeah. and and if you compare the data uh, from where we are today, as at November, to same time last year, November, uh, that import bill has gone down by as much as 400 million. Mm. So this is potential demand, which either to uh, would have come to the doorsteps of the central bank for 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 financing. Mm -hmm. So it would have come through the banks to the central bank to finance this. If it's gone down significantly, mm -hmm. okay. so it's an evolution of things that have happened so that demand going down is surely good for for, for the for the city it's good for the city it's good for the city because uh, we will not get uh, agents coming in to demand mm. yes. that amount for 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 imports so the import compression story is mm. is true the other one is monetary policy mm -hmm. I, I if you look at our September monetary policy uh, uh, press release we did come out with some measures mm -hmm. Uh, on top of the interest rate increase that we had, we we increased the cash reserve ratio uh, of the banks, and basically we were telling the banks that for all the deposits that you had, you needed to hold a portion in reserves at the central bank. Mm -hmm. uh, so we progressively uh, uh, increased it from 12, 13, 14, and then the last one was supposed to have happened in November, 15 percent. So, 15 percent of all deposits in the in the banking system were supposed to be locked as reserves, mm -hmm. and uh, it was designed to try to prevent excess liquidity from cashing out into the economy mm -hmm. to chase the the, the 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 dollars or to demand dollars. That policy was was successful. Uh, uh, it was it was it it was able to rake in substantial amount of liquidity from the so, banks. So, so, so the performance of the city now is not just. Uh, uh, so I'm a, coming. I'm, okay. I'm 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 just okay. I'm just li listing out mm -hmm. listing out okay. the factors. Mm -hmm. So so the monetary policy is is also part of the story. Uh, we have constrained liquidity in the system, and then the other one is what we just saw. The government of Ghana, IMF, okay. staff level okay. agreement, okay. that in itself also brought some confidence. Mm -hmm. Okay, that the outlook mm -hmm. uh, looks very good, good. Uh, and that if we're able to follow 
uh, the right steps and implement our fiscal consolidation plan and stick to the debt restructuring agenda. Uh, it bodes well for economic stability. And I think agents have internalized this. They see that the outlook is good. Uh, and therefore, that in itself has, has brought about some feel-good factor, some confidence and it's impacting on, 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 on the exchange rate. I see. That, 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 that's great. So, so, so it was good you mentioned that the import compression and the, the monetary uh, policy, policy decisions. Because for, for many people, yeah. Uh, it, yeah, it's, it's been just the announcement by the IMF that that, that has resulted. You know, so it means that quite some work is going on behind the scenes, yeah. which is reflecting in the, in the, yeah. in the positive. And of course, you know, if you talk to any Forex Bureau dealer now, mm -hmm. he tells you, there's no CD liquidity. Mm. So there's a crunch. Yes. And you go there, and they are not able to even change the dollars that you have for, mm. you for CDs. They might tell you to go and come back later. Mm -hmm. That kind of story. It's a I liquidity see. story permeating through the system to the Forex Bureau. I see. Uh, and that's the story. It's part of the story. I see. But the SLE, the staff level agreement, uh, was big news mm -hmm. this week. Uh, it has shaped the minds of agents. It's brought about some confidence. Great. This will continue for some time. For some time. Yeah. We are likely to see this continue for some time. So talking about staff level agreement. So, uh, prior to the staff level agreement, we, we, we announced that we we're going to the IMF on 1st July, you know, yeah. this year, after a lot of back and forth. We finally decided to go to the IMF. Now, uh, sometime last week, we announced a debt operation program or a debt exchange program. So, so, so Mr. Akes, can you help us appreciate what the government intends to do with its debt operation program and what that means for bondholders and, and other investors in the country? Well, thank you very much, um, Salom. Maybe I'll just uh, pick back on my um, colleague's rendition on the exchange rate and maybe just give you some one fact. Okay. For every 50 pesos increase in the exchange, it adds about 14 billion Ghana cities to the desktop. Yeah. So as he was given a rendition with a steep increase in September, without even transacting debt, you are having multiple increases just because you have more than half of the entire desktop owed to external parties which was contracted in dollars or other currencies. Yeah. In fact, we convert all of them to dollars before you convert to cities, so you have cross exchange yeah. rate. So the exchange rate you see the desktop is very sensitive to exchange rate depreciation. Mm -hmm. Now, you were asked about the program itself. Maybe I'll go back a little bit because it's the first time in our history mm -hmm. ever attempting something like this, of this nature. The debt operation. Of this nature, yes. Okay. The debt operation of this nature. We, we have many debt operations, market-led operations that you may have heard about, reprofiling, etc. Mm -hmm. They are market-led operations. Okay. And um, they are not a distress kind of operation level. But this is something that um, we've not seen before. Not many countries have been able to do that. Mm. And for example, if I use how the IMF puts it, that is like a medical doctor, the decision to make a surgery. Mm. If that is the, it will become the only option left for you to do, and then you do the surgery. Mm. But even then, you make a decision. If that surgery, at the end of it, the net benefit will be positive, then you go and do that. Mm. So the debt treatment is more like um, a surgical uh, procedure. Mm. And you have to be able to be certain that the weight of the balance, that when you embark upon it, you are going to have um, positive effects. And I'm happy to see that the way the exchange rate is behaving mm -hmm. is exactly what we mentioned from last week. And this is the, this is the, the effect. Yeah. Now, what leads us here? Um, first of all, we need to do a debt sustainability analysis that is a measure of risk, mm -hmm. right? And then I'm sure you may have heard so much about a debt to GDP ratio of more than 100%. 104% or so. Yeah, 104%, yeah. But then again, you see in the budget statement, 76%. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. So people feel a bit confused. Actually, the inputs of data into a debt sustainability analysis usually is not published. Mm. There are inputs into the data, and there are standards that, do, that deal with it. And we are using the IMF um, low-income country methodology or framework. Mm. And there, there's a concept that you call general government. I will explain that. Okay. You see that the budget statements, especially for those who go and pay budget statements of the old, 
when you go to where you have their budget, you see it's written at the top, central government. Mm. I'm sure somebody will wonder, why do you write central government? Why don't you say government uh, fiscal? But central government, because that is the classification of ministries, departments, and agencies. What they contract is what is in there. It excludes government assets and interest in state-owned enterprises, companies, and other um, private sector-led operations like that. But when it comes to a debt sustainability analysis, you're not only looking at debt in that narrow definition. Mm. You're looking at debt in terms of liabilities. That if those liabilities crystallize today, what will be the fiscal effort that government has to do to pay back? Mm -hmm. So assuming that uh, as we came to this program, we paid for this program and we've not paid for it, mm -hmm. it will be added to the desktop. Okay. But in actual fact, it will be an invoice. Mm -hmm. It has no term, it has no interest, it has no principal. Mm -hmm. It's an outstanding payment. But in a debt sustainability analysis, that will be added. That will be added. Yeah. But then it goes as an input to show a risk a determination. So the high debt distress is a combination of this classification. Mm -hmm. So I think I've used this to also explain that. Mm -hmm. Now, looking at every country, how do you measure the risk? You look at the debt carrying capacity of the country. Mm -hmm. And it's a combination of many measures in here. Looking at Ghana's case, our debt carrying capacity, it will be a present value of debt of not more than 55% to mm. GDP. So once you heard that we are hitting 100% plus, what it meant is that we need to halve the debt stock to be sustainable. Mm -hmm. Now, that is not the only story. There are also debt service indicators. Debt services, you don't use GDP to pay for debt. You yes. use cash to pay for debt, and that's from our revenue. Mm -hmm. But already we take our revenue and we have as much as almost 70% used for the debt yes, service. Yes, then we are left with 30%. Mm -hmm. If you take uh, my colleagues here, our salary, which is more than half, then invariably there is an internal imbalance. Mm -hmm. We call it internal imbalance. Yeah. And when you have the internal imbalance, you need to adjust it. Now that adjustment can be either through the deficit or revenue and expenditure or combination of both. But when you look into the budget carefully, you will see that there is an item called the domestic primary balance. Mm. And I will draw your attention to Appendix 2, Appendix 3 of the budget statement. When you go below the memorandum, you see a memorandum item there. Those indicators are not there just for the fun of it, mm -hmm. but they tell a story. And the domestic primary balance has a direct link with debt accumulation. When it's in the surplus, debt reduces by the same measure. When it's in the deficit, debt increases by the same measure. Now the point is, at 100% debt to GDP ratio, mm -hmm. that primary balance you see there, you see in the outlook, is about 1% per year. Mm -hmm. So if I take 10 years, that will be 10%. That means debt will come down from 100 to 90, mm -hmm. right? That is from the fiscal adjustment. Mm -hmm. That is the most important tool of government to adjust debt. How do we get to 55? Mm -hmm. Will it be 30 years? With that, we needed to do something about the stock. Mm -hmm. And that is why we have to weigh the balance if we do a debt treatment. That debt burden that would reduce, what will be the flip side if we don't do it? Mm -hmm. Right? So it's a, it's a balancing item. If we don't do it, can this country survive another 50% depreciation next year? Mm -hmm. If you look at your money in two cumulative years, that will sound like 100% or something like that. Again, can we, how would a country be like if we had an inflation of another 50%? What would be the value of your, your fund in your pocket? Can we stand that? My colleague mentioned GDP to 3%, all-time low for about 40 years or so. And can we survive that for two years? Won't we be going into a recession? Mm. So it's a, it's a carefully thought through process with something we've not done before, but something we've seen in others with experience on the back and looking at it that this may be the only option to get out of the crisis as quickly and sustainable as possible. Mm. And that is what we announced on the Tuesday. If you have enough time for me, I can go into details because the details is even... Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so going to the details, let's appreciate, you know, how come, you know, certain categories of people as in persons, you know, natural or artificial are, yeah. are affected and others are not. So, for example, uh, individual bondholders are not affected in, in all this restructuring or debt operation. 
uh, treasury bill holders or treasury bill you know investors are not affected by institutional investors or bond holders are affected why what went into that what was the thinking behind that right so we have the desktop now we'll just put the external aside and look at the domestic so the domestic we announced when you go into the domestic who are the holders there mm. there are multiple people there are individuals like you and i when i look at you i'm sure you you have a CSE number, you, you have a, a treasury bill bond to your name. So individuals like you. Then we also will have firms and institutions who also are there. You have people in collective investment scheme. If all of us here decide we pull our funds together mm -hmm. and create value from that asset class, they are also there. They also have people who we call non-residents or mm -hmm. foreigners. Mm -hmm. Those who, buy, who we borrow from also come in. They have a custodian bank. They change their foreign exchange. And then they buy the um, domestic risk, mm -hmm. that's what we we'll say. So these are all the multiple elements. Mm -hmm. Now, if you listen carefully to the announcement, you notice that all the institutions we have mentioned, including banks, they are regulated. Mm -hmm. The institutions who are playing there are regulated, except you and I. Okay. No more regulating. You. you made a decision to buy government instruments in your room. Maybe you have your wife who would guide you, or you know, you have a couple of friends, mm -hmm. but nobody regulates you. Mm -hmm. So with a debt treatment that could have unintended effects on the economy, it is easy for the regulator to be a last stop to protect the regulated environment or those who are in. And I'm sure you heard the central bank announcing some of those effects. Yes. The pensions regulator is there announcing. Insurance is also in there. You have the securities in the exchange. These four are the regulators who can do that. Mm. Who protects the individual? Mm. No one does. Nobody. Yeah. So excluding the individuals was a thought through process that um, it would be difficult to understand the, what made the four of us decide to buy a treasury bill. It could be he's paying school fees. It could be yours is for paying rent. It could be that his is sub, um, helping his income. It could be that mine is for my pension in the future. If I put all those four, I can't have a package that can satisfy you. Mm -hmm. But it's easier for the regulator. So that's, that's the first thing. Is it also not the case that the, the cumulative you know, investment of these people in terms of volumes is, is just very insignificant that you do not need to, 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 to burden them by taking that small you know, money when you look at the, the, the whole? Because, yes. So, so that's, right. that that's, right. yeah, that's about 8 billion Ghana CDs. Yeah. The total we have now is about 137. 37. So okay. that's about 140 million. So yeah. again, it's a science and an art. Mm. The science is we should go into it, but uh, when you combine the art on intended effects, mm. you can drop that. And we, we, we did we did we did drop mm. that out of the whole perimeter. Mm. Then again you have the treasure bills. Mm -hmm. Now remember the treasure bills, we're buying it almost every week. Yeah. Yeah. So there's maturity every week that is going on. So when we give the um, program for the exchange to occur, it crossed more than one week, it's mm. ten days. So what is happening to those who within that will have had maturity or carried on in treasury bills? So there's a practical difficulty in applying treasury bills into a perimeter of debt restructuring. So most countries don't actually apply the treasury bills. Then again, also we're very much aware that this debt treatment could somehow have an effect on the domestic market. Mm -hmm. There could not be, um, there may not be much money coming in. So you notice that when you look into the budget, you see zero zero in some of the financing for the net domestic side but at least the treasury bill market will be open mm -hmm. and there will still be some activity that will help liquidity so, so to be clear persons with investments in treasury bills they are not affected and as we speak those with maturing investments can have their money and everything is moving on smoothly and uninterrupted Yes, for, uh, for tomorrow, uh, no, Friday, yes, Friday, there will be an auction. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure those last week, those who, did, who wanted to take their money, mm -hmm. had their money. Those who wanted to come on also had that. So it's operating. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, yeah. it's working. Mm -hmm. And that has been excluded from the, the, whole, the, whole, the whole perimeter. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. So, so um, Dr. Drish, uh, yes. help us understand why it was important for government to spread, you know, the, the operation. Is it a 15-year spread? So we have you know, investment, I mean, so the, it's a debt exchange program. So persons with uh, maturing bonds, you know, how to exchange that for four new ones to mature in 2024, 2027, 2029, 2032, 2037. Can you explain to us why that is important to do? And also why 
people with investments will not get anything in terms of interest in 2023, but will only get 5% and 10% you know, in the following years. Okay, I will respectfully defer to my colleague, who is the right. director for me, the IMF okay. 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 so, so you want to know the rationale yeah. behind it? Now, let, me, let me put it this way. Yeah. Okay. We have as many as yeah. existing bonds, about 60 of them operating. Okay. Yeah. Now for 2023 alone, we have as many as 18 maturing. Mm. That's about one and a half for every month. Okay. Now, in the investment field, assuming you want to invest, and I want to find a yield curve that is like what interest will I get? Mm. Which of the bonds next year are you going to use as a reference to guide the market? Mm. So we have a fragmented mm. bond market operation. So one of the major thoughts of defragmenting all of them and then making them, uh, bring them into less than 10 was one of the strategies to help build the market. Mm -hmm. Don't forget we have euro bonds of about $13 billion outstanding. Mm -hmm. But how many are they? They are almost like single digit. Mm -hmm. So why do we have less in the domestic and you have as many as 60 and you have that many issuances almost every week from Treasury? So it's also reforming the market in a bit. Now with the four, now look at the strategy in there. You will notice that, um, as you rightly said, 2027, 29, 32, and 37. Um, the reason being that within the whole space of sense, if the market is closed for next year, and that is why we are paying the 0%, mm -hmm. if we are not getting the people to bring in bonds, we are not floating bonds, we are not getting that financing, so we will not, we'll be unable to pay for an interest, and that is why you see the 0 mm -hmm. So it is to help us to be able to close the, the, the budget yeah. and then have a balance in that. My, my colleague can explain that to mm -hmm. you. The following year, we presume that the market will start getting better. People will be seeing the confidence will start restoring, so we we'll have the ability to pay 5%. Mm -hmm. Then the next year is 10 If the financial situation has the ability to pay more, why not? We will have put that on, right? So that's why it is stepped, 0, 5, and then 10 yeah. Now there's another addition that you don't hear anybody talking about, and I'll explain that. When you take the budget and you go into the financing, you see in the foreign financing, you see the loans we are going to procure, and then you see amortization, that is payment of the, of the, of the loans that are maturing or even those that are not maturing. But you don't see that for the domestic. Mm. So what you see is we are increasing domestic stock, but it doesn't seem to have a fiscal plan of paying the stock. Mm. Right? People come in and go, but the net effect is an increase. In this case, looking at the stress tests on the financial institutions, there will be a payback of each and every debt that we have for the time. So for simplicity and illustration, let me use that the 137 billion, I will transfer them into 100 Ghana cities. Okay. So let's say the whole debt stock is 100 cities. Mm -hmm. So the terms are that 17% of that will be put into 2027. Mm -hmm. So that is 17 cities in 2027. Then 17% again in 2029. Mm -hmm. So that is 17 cities in 2029. Then you have an increase to 25 cities, that's 25% percent in 2032 then you have a huge amount of 41 percent or 41 cities in the 2037 mm -hmm. now the 17 cities in the first bond that's the shortest bond in 2027 will pay back in two installments for two consecutive years mm -hmm. so we divide the 17 by 2 and we get 8.5 mm -hmm. in 2026 that 8.5 will be paid then in 2027 will pay the 8.5. That means the 17 cities is extinguished. Okay. Then we have the next one, that is 2029, that also has 17 cities in there, 17%. We divide that by two again. So that's 8.5 cities. We pay that in 2028. We pay 8.5 cities in 2029. Mm -hmm. So by 2029, 34% or 34 cities will have been yeah, paid off. Then we have the 2032. Mm -hmm. Now there, remember, I said 25% or 25 cities. That is more than the 17. Yes. We are looking at the ability of my colleague's budget to be able to pay that off. Yeah. So two years may be tough. So we'll do it in three years. Three years. So we divide 25 by three and we get eight. Mm -hmm. That's the magic number of eight. eight. Mm -hmm. So the eight, we start it in 2030, eight, 2031, eight, 2032, eight. So in total, we have 25 cities, 17 cities, and 17 cities, mm. adding up to 59 cities paid by the end of 2032. That's 59% of the entire stock will be paid down. Mm. Then you have the last one, 
the three thirty seven. Now that is uh, forty one festival, uh, forty one cities, of cities. Uh, forty one yeah, but that's larger than the seventeen and twenty five. So you divide up by five, mm. and forty one divided by five is eight. eight. So again, you have a magic eight number. So and that you start again in twenty thirty three, thirty four, thirty five. 36 and 37 and that extinguishes the whole net profile right mm -hmm. and that will call for a um, discipline a fiscal discipline and that will call for a responsible debt treatment that mm -hmm. is ensuring that we close the legacy out of the show so that is a deal and that would ensure that people so will by which time we have dealt with the 37 billion cities we are seeking to exchange. very very good mm -hmm. and that would be there. now again there's also another factor um, if everything goes on well, we cannot do a, something they call a pure liability management. Mm -hmm. Liability management is a market operation, which means that if, for example, we do more revenue measures, yeah. we get more receipts coming into place and we have excess money, we can take the money and come to you and say, Salom, your bond has matured in 2037. Mm -hmm. I would like to buy off now. Mm -hmm. Because don't forget that one of the key things of the IMF program is price stability mm -hmm. and inflation of single digit. If you get inflation of 6%, then there's a real return of 1% if you have the bond holding at 10%. So I can come in and offer you maybe 8% for that, and I take it off. You have gotten the liquidity up front. Yeah. So it doesn't necessarily mean that, um, assuming I'm retired and I have, um, God forbid, a few years to go, I'll wait for 2027 <laughs> because I want all my maturities in 2027. <laughs> so um, those measures are there that can all be able to help in the operation. Mm. Maybe let me halt here if you have okay, yeah, so, so, so let, let me let me bring in um, okay. um, uh, Dr. Idrisu to, yeah. to help us understand really what so we've done all of this. Yeah. IMF appears quite happy. So we have reached the staff level agreement. Yeah. What is the staff level agreement yeah. and how important is this step or this stage yeah. for the entire process okay. to getting an IMF deal? Okay. Yeah. So thank you so much. I think before we even delve into what a staff level agreement. Uh, maybe it will be important to understand why we even went in for an IMF program in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a very important point because usually um, people just um, see us go for an IMF program without understanding the context. Mm -hmm. You know, my colleagues and I have actually spelled out some of the economic challenges that the country is facing, and they are from all angles, global, domestic, um, talk about debt, talk about the fiscal, talk about the external, talk about monetary, everywhere. And when you are in such an economic crisis, you need a comprehensive set of measures to deal with the crisis. Mm -hmm. So what is government doing? So government in the 2022, 2023 budget is proposing a combination of measures to address this economic crisis. And this includes the IMF program. Okay. So the IMF program is expected to um, generate the confidence that is needed to be restored uh, for the Ghana economy uh, to come back to normalcy and to pave the way for economic recovery. Um, but also, um, it is also intended to provide um, the avenue for us to be able to restore fiscal and debt sustainability, mm. as he mentioned. And also, when you go into an IMF program, one of the uh, quick advantages is that you're able to get uh, financing. Okay. I mean, a hard currency to support both your balance of payment and budget needs. Mm -hmm. But apart from that, it also catalyzes financing from other development partners. So all of these advantages are there. So that's one of the uh, solutions that was proposed, uh, which was accepted, and government eventually uh, mm -hmm. went into a program. But you see, it has, it's a combination of factors. So apart from the IMF pro going into an IMF program, um, then we have the um, debt operations that my colleague talked about. Uh, but then that even the debt operation itself alone would not be able to deal with the issue. And that's how come if you go into the 2022 budget, we're also proposing for uh, consideration and approval of parliament. 2023 budget. budget, yes. A couple of fiscal measures. Mm. And when we say fiscal measures, we are looking at measures in the revenue side, on the revenue side, mm. and then expenditure side. I mean, measures that will enhance revenue mobilization, measures that will rationalize expenditures. So we have a number of measures in the 2023 budget. That's mm. 
um, seeking to enhance revenue collection. In fact, if you look into the numbers, you realize that we are trying to um, achieve a revenue effort of about 1.35% 1 1 of GDP. GDP. This is like new effort bringing in new money, new money from the revenue side. And there are the specifics, including the VAT and all the other measures that we are we table before parliament. But we don't want to do that from the revenue side alone, but also expenditures. Mm -hmm. And so if you go into the budget, you realize that there's a lot of expenditure rationalization measures. But, but those so we have measures to, to be very inadequate and, and quite well, cosmetic. We can discuss that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, it's. I mean, this is a process, and you can you always have to start from somewhere. But we can discuss about the um, the intensity or the magnitude of the savings that will be generated. In fact, if you go into the 2023 budget, mm -hmm. you realize that if you look at the expenditures on commitment basis, including payables and all that. The effort from 2022 to 2023 is about 2 percent of GDP. Mm. Uh, so there's quite some adjustment on the expenditure side as well. So it's not only the revenue, but also on the expenditure side. We can go into the details later. Mm. But the point I'm trying to make is that it's not just debt operation, but also fiscal adjustment. Mm. And it's not just fiscal adjustment and debt operation, also IMF. And it's not just these three. Mm -hmm. We're also looking at implementing a number of structural reforms which will address structural bottlenecks in the economy. Mm. Um, these structural bottlenecks um, would usually relate to the, way the PFM, I mean, public financial management. I mean, um, you know, weaknesses that um, c kind of twat our efforts in ensuring that we're actually maximizing the revenue collection or we are minimizing expenditure leakages and all that. So we've identified all of these leakages, not only the PFM, even the SOE side, uh, fiscal risks. We've identified all of these uh, bottlenecks and we are designing um, very strong structural reforms to address all of these. So that's also a package mm. that um, government um, is putting forward uh, to be implemented. But apart from that, when you go into an adjustment process like this, you would definitely will have some stakeholders who would actually um, should I say be affected by these adjustments? We call it cost of adjustment. And so, in the 2023 budget, what government is proposing is also to prioritize um, social protection uh, so that identified vulnerable groups uh, will be protected, would enhance the expenditures, so that we ensure that the impact of or the burden of adjustment is fairly distributed. Mm. So, it's a very comprehensive package. package. Uh, you know, that's um, is being um, uh, proposed to address this whole uh, economic um, crisis that the country is facing. Mm -hmm. Now, back let, to the let, IMF. Yes, let, let me back deal with this with you. So, yeah. so um, this is a point of view. Okay. Uh, we are live on uh, City TV, obviously, and on City Tube. Uh, ordinarily, we should have been concluding by now, but we've been graciously given extra 30 minutes so we can uh, exhaust some of the matters. So, uh, my guest, um, you just heard Dr. Uh, Idrisu. Uh, who is a director for Economic Strategy and Research Division at uh, the Ministry of Finance. And he's just helping us appreciate what um, has gone into uh, the, the IMF package, you know, the, 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 the policy decisions they are making, you know, that is bringing us where we are now. So now he's just about talking about the uh, staff level agreement, what that means, how important that is in reaching you know, a final deal, so we can say that we have a deal with the IMF, which is going to bring in $3 billion. Great, so thank you. So, so the question is, so what's the staff level agreement? After we've explained, I mean, the motivation for going for an IMF program. So basically, a staff level agreement is actually the first step mm -hmm. um, towards achieving approval for a fund supported program. Okay. That's the first step. And what does that mean? So what that basically means is that um, it is reached when the policies and programs proposed by the country to the fund mm. have been accepted by the fund at the staff level. When I say at the staff level, level at the IMF staff, staff level, level, not at the board level, mm. at the staff level. So that involves all the technicalities. It involves um, the program agreement on the program objectives. Mm. It involves agreement on some of the structural reforms that have to be undertaken to address structural bottlenecks. I mean, it involves some of the conditionalities that would go, you know, with the program, um, you know, and all that. It involves some of the prior actions that must be taken for 
the program to go to the board. It involves discussion of some of the measures, including even the debt operations that my colleague talked about, um, as well as discussions on uh, f uh, financing assurances that donors would have to provide to augment uh, financing needs and all that. So all of these discussions have been held, and the fund is satisfied at the staff level that what the government of Ghana is proposing is something that they can support. Mm -hmm. And by the way, let me just mention that um, immediately government announced that we should engage for a fund program. Um, what His Excellency the President did um, was to be caused to be uh, formed a negotiation team. Mm -hmm. So this negotiation team was formed, which was led by the, the, finance, the finance minister. Um, and the team came from many angles. So we had the oversight team, which was basically the ministerial, the minister, the governor, some other ministers, etc. And then they had a technical team mm -hmm. as well. So the technical group comprised membership from the central bank, the Ministry of Finance, the office of the vice president, you know, and all that. And at the same time, um, His Excellency the President also uh, directed the Minister of Finance to lead the preparation of Ghana's domestic program, which will be presented before the fund for consideration. And that is what we refer to as the post-COVID-19 program for economic growth. And that growth had a lot, had about eight pillars or so, uh, with macroeconomic, with I mean objectives, which by and large uh, was agreed um, with the fund and with. Uh, components to address the economic challenges, which by and large were agreed uh, w with the fund. So after all of these, a um, couple of meetings were held, three rounds of negotiations were held, um, the fund filled their admission to Ghana, um, the Ghana team also went to Washington to continue negotiations, they came back, and in this final round, we were able to achieve that staff level agreement, which is a very big milestone in the approval process. Mm. And the question you asked was, so after the staff level agreement, what next? Yes. You know, when you achieve a staff level agreement, that's not the end of it. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, what you are looking for is a program, a fund-supported program. And you get a fund-supported program only when the program has been packaged and sent to the board for approval. So we still have uh, a couple of, um, you know, a couple, of, a couple of things to do. To do. But, but exactly. Can anything go wrong, for example? So yeah. um, I'll, I'll, I'll in a bit get to the yeah. difficulties we are having yeah. with the unions, right. etc. Yeah. But at this stage, to the next one, what can go wrong? Can anything go wrong? It goes to the board. The board is okay. You promise to do this. You fail to do it. And so we cannot give you a program. What would the board be looking out for before they finally give us a program? Well, before, before we... I think the question should be, what should happen even mm -hmm. before we go to the board. Okay. And then the next question will be, if you okay. go to the board, what will happen before okay. it will be sure. rejected? So there are, as part of the fund program, we have what we call prior actions. Okay. So those are actions that have to be agreed upon with the fund and implemented even before we go to the fund, mm -hmm. uh, we go to the board. What are some of these? So for example, we prepared the 2023 budget to reflect some of these broad measures that I told you about and they include some revenue measures. Mm -hmm. Revenue measures are expected to give us a certain yield. So we are, as I mentioned, we are, we are looking at um, effort of about 1.3% of GDP. Now, these have been placed before Parliament. They will be discussed, they will be debated, and then um, they will be considered, and eventually uh, approvals would have to be given, as well as expenditure measures. So one of the things that would actually promote the um, sending of the documents to the fund and also eventual approval will be for the country or the country's parliament to approve the budget. Mm -hmm. Anything that is short of that would mean that even though we have very good policies in the budget, uh, if it cannot be passed by parliament, then it means that it will affect the program mm -hmm. because the program is dependent on the policies that have been outlined in the budget. So that's one such example. Mm -hmm. So we have to make sure that then, all then, of these... Then, then we should really yes. be getting concerned, given yeah. the, uh, the issues a minority, for example, has begun raising. Because they have issues with some of the revenue measures. The e-levy, scrapping the threshold and taking it down to 1%. They say they want it at 0.5%, and even the threshold increased. You know? And so because of that, they are, they are cautioning that, you know, that may struggle. 
they talk about VAT also, which is a very critical part of the budget and the revenue measures, then we should really be getting concerned about this and we should start engaging them so we have a common ground, yeah. really. Well, I think that's a very important point you've made. Um, engagement is extremely important. Um, I'm sure every stakeholder who is interested in, the, in Ghana coming out of this crisis will do everything possible to make sure that they contribute their quota uh, for us to get out of this crisis. And one of the ways of doing that is to actually look at the budget, of course on its merit, mm -hmm. and then consider, uh, consider it uh, favorably. It is also their responsibility to make sure that whatever measures government proposes in the budget are measures that we inure to the benefit of the country. And they have to also look at it, uh, the parliament must look at it from their perspective as well. So I think it's a matter of ensuring that there is, there is effective engagement at mm -hmm. all levels, effective engagement of the, at the majority side, at the minority side, uh, the technical team also doing their best to explain the policy. Sometimes when you are not able to explain the rationale or the motivations behind the policies, then it becomes very difficult to appreciate for anyone to consider. But mm -hmm. once those explanations are made, then they are able to ease the um, approval process. Very um, well. Yeah, so, yeah. That's, so that's just one of the, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. one of the factors. So, so, yeah. so after this, we go to the management and board level yes. to get the approval, then, exactly. then, then we are sorted. Then we are sorted. That's correct. Realistically, yeah. how long do you think this will take, realistically? Well, um, I think that if you look at when, the, when we started work um, from 1st July mm -hmm. to engage for a farm program, uh, the period that it has taken for the staff level agreement to be reached. We didn't just get there. Mm -hmm. A lot of effort went into it, a lot. In fact, it took the commitment from the highest level right to the technical, to the commitment from the fund uh, for us to achieve that. Yeah, and you hope to get the same commitment? I, to get I, I'm expecting mm -hmm. that same commitment will be demonstrated between now and when we go to the board. I and see. there's every, indica every indication that that commitment is there. Uh, so I expect that um, we should speed up But, but, but the some of the things to happen between now and then yeah. are not things really within your control. Yes. So, for example, yeah. the issue about the, the unions, yeah. you know, the issue about what the minority is saying and things like that, they are not entirely within your reach. But let me take a few messages. Some okay. of your messages are okay. coming. Yeah. Please, please keep bringing technocrats like this to the show. <laughs> they are bringing hope to us. Based from yeah. Nathan, Ashring, you know, I will see. Some of your guests sound very good and nice but only hypothetical. We, we're going to be running some unrealistic deficit targets and those could throw all these talks overboard. The question is, are we so disciplined to stick and achieve the targets, bearing in mind 2024 elections? This is Mani Unaifa. I get your point. This is the point of view. We'll be back and discuss a few more issues. Then we, we, can, we can call it a day. Don't go away. Did you know that every time you drink red choco, you support 100% sustainably sourced Ghanaian cocoa and give a child access to quality education? Well done. This advert is FDA approved. This is Doha. This is Qatar. We come together tonight in the billion of us in every corner of the globe where the beautiful game matters. Here for the show-stopping magic of a moment. Get DSTV access with an HD decoder plus dish kit for only 169 Ghana cities and upgrade to compact to watch all the 64 matches here for every fan. All right, welcome back to The Point of View. Uh, we are having a conversation on Ghana's road to economic recovery with um, some important persons, technocrats, you know, around the table from the Bank of Ghana and the Ministry of, um, of Finance. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Alas Andrisu, yes. who is the Director of Economic Strategy and Research Division of the Ministry of Finance, was just helping us appreciate uh, what 
the 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 process is the staff level to the board level yeah. uh, agreement where we can say we are done we have a deal now and what could happen in between and what should not happen yeah. and you know i was just asking what the impact of what minority the minority is saying could be and what uh, the, the 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 matter of the pension the unions on their pensions could be but uh, i see you've been making quite some notes um, I, I, I know. I know the Bank of Ghana is also very much involved in this. It talked about the very top level, yeah. um, ministerial level, which includes the, or which comprises the, the, the governor, the minister, and a few others. Um, what role does the Bank of Ghana have to get us where we really have to get to in clinching the uh, the deal or, or, or the, the agreement proper? So our mandate. Mm -hmm. We need to chase our mandate. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the law, our mandate is inflation. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you look at the deal... Before that, are there targets, are there, are there macroeconomic targets in, in the deal, in, yes. the, in the agreements yep. as we have it? So if you're unable to meet those targets, yeah. then it means the program, we could derail, the, the program won't happen? So basically, the way an IMF program is structured um, is uh, to, to um, infuse into the program. Okay. Um, indicators or indicative targets. Okay. They, we call it quantitative performance criteria. Mm -hmm. And those mm -hmm. are done on quarterly basis. Okay. But the program itself is monitored on semi-annual basis. Okay. So when a program is approved by the board, for example, then you have a fund supported program. Every six months, the IMF would actually come for a review and review the program. Mm -hmm. It's only upon successful review of the program that you get a tranche of the three billion that okay. you know um, goes with the with the program. Okay. So that three billion is for a period of uh, three years, mm -hmm. and it will be released in, in equal tranches. In okay. tranches, equal tranches. Yes. Yeah. So, so like you said, yeah. there's a path for okay. yeah. for inflation mm -hmm. in the program, and uh, we are supposed to attain those inflation uh, targets uh, under the program mm -hmm. for 2023. Mm -hmm. Now, what is going to happen is that these targets. Uh, are going to be bounded. Let's say there'll be a central path of inflation, mm -hmm. there'll be an inner band, and then there'll be an outer band. Outer band. So the inner and the outer band are, are sort of me measures of volatility. Mm -hmm. Basically, there's recognition that inflation could move, we could be hit with shocks, mm -hmm. and therefore, when these targets are set, they are not set in stone we allow for some allowance mm -hmm. so there's a first inner band you could go above that inner band and there's an outer band there's an outer band such that when it crosses that outer band it could trigger some form of consultation mm -hmm. And and, and and we we'll need to explain to the IMF. Yeah, I like board. the term consultation. You know, it could trigger some form, some form of consultation. Yeah, 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 yeah. It. it could trigger some form of consultation, and uh, we might be required to explain to the IMF board why inflation has gone above that outer mm. band. So so so, so it, there it, are mechanisms. Yeah, and it's a lot of uh, discipline. And, it's and that's a lot what, of discipline. That, that's what we've lacked, and that's what hopefully the IMF will do to us. Indeed, there, there are. People who have said that we exited an IMF program in 2019 yeah. and just 2020, yeah, 2021, then we got ourselves in the mess again. again. Yeah. So it means that on our own, we are unable to, to discipline ourselves and manage our economy. Of course, you know, that's, that's, that's if we don't consider what those external shocks, COVID, etc., have been. But um, let, let me just come to you, um, um, Sarakis. The, the, the unions, the, the pension people, they appear to be unhappy with the program because they say it's inimical to their pensions uh, to the extent that next year they are not making any uh, gains on their investments you know they don't even know what they are going to be paying their people etc is there a way government can you know meet them halfway or you know in in, in all these arrangements so we have a smooth takeoff of the program uh i want to say you from a different angle altogether okay uh, we are all contributing to pension, sure. right? Okay. So okay. we are all stakeholders in that. So my pension is my future. Mm -hmm. Our economy, collectively, mm -hmm. is my future. Mm -hmm. So the two are not mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. And if you look at all the investment fund pools, pension funds 
are the ones that are very volatile to macroeconomic stability. Okay. So if I use it, if I take today, no one in the country who has any fund, treasury or bond, market to market, is getting the original face value. So our pension funds are stressed this year, mm -hmm. right? Because the macroeconomic conditions have changed. The asset class were bought when they were 20%, and today they are trading at double that. So mm -hmm. you, 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 we, we, we've lost in that. So the leadership of the economy is changing the crisis to let the macro be stable and have a future in that. Mm -hmm. We can also understand why the leadership on the pension are looking at what securing the future of the pension. But the debt treatment, as, as, as you can see from anywhere, it's not a palatable thing. Right? Mm -hmm. It's going like yes. you're going on the surgery. Mm -hmm. So you can appreciate also where they're coming from. Yeah. The issue and the point is the two must be together. Yeah. Yeah. Talk. What do we want to see in our pension in the next 10 years? Is it when you have another 50% depreciation, 50% inflation that could wipe out the whole pension? All together, we'll work to reach that point where our pension, our economy will be our future. Mm -hmm. So a lot of um, requirements are expected. Don't forget, this is novel. Nobody has seen it before. And you realize the, um, the reaction, even in the first instance that, that, that happened. Mm -hmm. You saw how people you know, felt. But as so, so I, I recall, was it, I think we had a meeting with one of the stakeholders on was it a Friday or a Saturday? And the, 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 the meeting, I mean, somebody leaked audio from the, from the meeting. And on Sunday, the, the, the health sector workers had to call a press conference to say quite a few things. Quickly, the minister had to come in the evening to make an announcement and say that they were going to launch a program the following day. That was on Monday. Yeah. What, was that the, the, the timeline or it was fast track because of, of, of the leaks and all of that? What, was that really the timeline? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, that was unfortunate, though. Mm, yes, it was. I, 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 I can understand. But yeah. sitting, I mean, yeah, we, yeah, we, yeah. we like information. <laughs> right, so right, right. <laughs> yeah, I, I understand that too. But also, remember yeah. that this is a tough decision. Mm -hmm. And stakeholder engagements are important. Mm -hmm. But remember, everybody sitting on the table there has a vested interest. Yes. We all are going on pension. So how independent and unbiased are all of us? And also, don't forget that information is key. Information is money. Information is behavior. So if you do behavior finance, you can behave based on information that you pay. As we started consulting all of us in this room here, by the following day, all of you have been at the bank taking your money. No bank deposits your money and then puts it there waiting for you to come on the day to pick all your 100%. So that meeting on a holiday, was not a trading day, was a holiday, was to have a stakeholder engagement. Mm -hmm. This is heavy thing, and government cannot do it alone. So it was a stakeholder engagement mm -hmm. that was trying to explain, because it's not everything that can be put on a publication. Mm -hmm. Let me just only mention two pages. Mm -hmm. But you could see from the questions and answers that there were many yeah. dimensions of things. So that was what happened on that day. Mm -hmm. With the way, and don't forget, uh, when we started work in the past, it could take three months to hold information. Yeah. Even if there's a leakage, yeah. you could control it. With social media, mm -hmm. within hours, yes. so it's all over the place. Yes. Yes, all over the place. So, economic management has also changed, mm -hmm. where it had to react. Saturday had come, Sunday morning was on, crisis had commenced, mm -hmm. and people were going to have a serious unintended effect on Monday morning. Some countries you've seen financial crisis occurring. So, even though the plan was to announce on a Monday morning, the Honorable Minister has to refuse yes. Yes, on, the, on the Sunday. Okay, so what, what level of uptake will be enough to ensure the success of the program? Now, we see a lot of people mm. saying they don't want it, they won't do it. So far, you know, we have mm. up to the 19th, which is mm. sometime next week. Yeah. Mm. You know, what's the uptake like now, and what level of uptake will you say is it's, it's, it's sufficient to ensure the success of the program? I don't know who takes that. Um, you. <laughs> All right, I'll take it. <laughs> I think uh, there's a lot of work for us to do. And, um, but do you have people responding to the invitation yet? Has anybody taken up the offer? Not yet, or not, not, as, not, not, not to the best of your knowledge? Um, we haven't checked it because also dealing with okay. a lot of um, okay. engagements okay. like, like yeah. we're doing. Yes, it's, yes. it's quite a very heavy mm -hmm. and very detailed. If, if we have an engagement on a technical level, mm -hmm. we will not be speaking this English. I, I, I get it. It will be heavy numbers I, and all kinds of models. So, Quite a lot of work has to be done. I think also we have a short window to engage everybody to 
um, explain and get more understanding. The expectation is that we we'll have a, everyone falling in line because the individuals are out, so you have more or less the, the institutions. Sometimes the uncertainty across people, you know, um, get that kind of um, reaction. But um, some of you are here. Um, I think that's the reason we've come here. For the first time, you've seen technocrats mm -hmm. trying to explain. Though the time is short yeah. because you, you're giving us things that we've done for days, mm -hmm. weekends, months, crashing all kind of numbers. It's, it's a bit too small to do that. So we'll, we'll, be, we'll be having many engagements. Yeah, so so, so, so let, 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 me, let me excuse yeah. you further. Um, people say that the IMF wasn't the only option available. There's a common framework, the DSSI, etc. Can you, in one minute, tell us why we did not go the common framework uh, uh, route? Right. Just okay, in one minute. Right, thank you. I, I believe you know the common framework replaces the DSSI. The, the DSSI, the DSSI yes. yeah. But at the time, the DSSI, when it came on in April 2020, um, if you look at it carefully, Ghana's debt profile had changed. Mm. The DSSI was by the G20 and for bilateral loans. Mm. Um, in the year 2000, before we went on HIPIC, bilateral and multilateral loans were about 94% of our debt stock. Mm. In 2020, it was about 5%. Now, the rate agencies did not know how to react because the issue is if you, um, when you look at the legal contents of our loans, there's something they call um, cross default, mm. meaning that if I default on my colleague Philip, it is taking us, you've defaulted on mine. Yeah. Mm. So if bilateral, I restructure it. If I restructure it, then it may connote a default across all our debt holdings. Now, when we learn some basic thing in, in school, I think in the university, they look at 80, 20 of the problem. Mm -hmm. Would you use 80% of the effort to solve 20% of the problem? Mm -hmm. At the time, it was five, it was 94%. Mm -hmm. But in 2020, it was 5%. I have 95% on solved problem. If I'm looking at debt service that I cannot pay, is it a 5% that would be critical or 95%? Mm -hmm. Would I love, at that time, the rate agencies by Moody's, we had B3 with a negative outlook. We could still have gone to the market with uncertainty and we're downgrading everyone. Would you chance for 5% solution to have also a downgrade? That's number two. Number three, there was also a legal question mm -hmm. that was arising from the debt suspension. It was only asking the private sector to voluntarily operate. Mm -hmm. And nobody had done that. So there's only three countries, Zambia, Chad, Ethiopia, have attempted it and not concluded it. Not concluded. So there's only history to that. Mm -hmm. So when you put all of that together, so again, the IMF surely is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a best approach you know, we, we, we have. Because, you know, obviously, the common framework, you know, given what we've seen with Chad, Ethiopia, and Zambia, we, we, and our context, we, we couldn't go that route, or we couldn't have gone that route. So that going the IMF way is, is, is the best option. Yeah, because nice. IMF also, you must, your conditions must be right. Yeah. You must have internal and external imbalance. Yeah. So, balance of payments on the side, by deficit system on the side, yeah. without a financial assurance. Yeah. Mm. So, once the two coincided, you go on the IMF program. But again, on the common framework, one of the conditions is you must be on an IMF program. Oh, okay. So, the DSSI, we didn't have an IMF program. Okay. So, okay. but this one, you had an IMF okay. program. Okay, that makes sense. So, let me take a final word, uh, uh, um, Dr. <coughs> final word, I think, I, think, I think the BOJ is working hard. Uh, to stabilize the current situation. We are watching closely inflation developments uh, and we will respond aggressively and do all what we can to contain inflation. Uh, we will continue to deepen our coordination with the Ministry of Finance. Mm -hmm. We work very closely. Yeah. We talk a lot amongst <laughs> ourselves. Uh, we do push policies to our superiors uh, who then take these things up to, to, to other levels. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so that coordination between us and Ministry of Finance is very key. Uh, we will work to deepen it further as we move along. I think one question on the minds of people is the city is depreciating, inflation is rising, you see a disconnect. Uh, when will these converge? Align. Yeah, align. I think that alignment is coming pretty much soon. We should expect that alignment. And I think in some uh, we should expect a sharp deceleration in inflation next year beyond that peak that we expect somewhere in the first quarter of 2023. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we are confident that inflation's deceleration is on a path that we think will help sustain economic activity more, we can then begin to ease interest rates 
uh, come down on interest rates, and then growth should begin to 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 pick up down the line in 2023. Very well. Uh, no, thank please, you. Thirty yes. seconds. Thirty seconds. So thank you. I think that. Um, we are not out of the woods yet, mm -hmm. um, and all stakeholders must come together, work together, to ensure that we are addressing these economic uh, challenges together. Um, I would like to use this platform um, to actually call on our creditors um, who are required or who are expected to provide financing assurances before we go to the board. That's very important, so I would like to use this platform to encourage them to provide that uh, financing assurances. Mm. I would also like to use this platform to um, call on all Ghanaians. In fact, the program, the IMF program involves in the implementation of structural reforms. Mm. These are very necessary but tough reforms. Mm. But we need the support of everyone. Everybody. Yeah, for Keep us to. And finally, Without commitment, this program wouldn't work. Very well. It wouldn't work. So, so we need commitment so we at all so levels, at the highest level, at the technical level, at CSO level. This, the civil society guys should police government. They mm. should make sure that you know, they are putting government as its toe to uh, implement um, you know, these programs well. So commitment is needed from all levels for us to succeed. Good. Let, me, let me share a few of the messages. I yeah. think people like this panel. I just love yeah. the panel. It's, it's good to leave the politicians out and let the technocrats and academia lead their discussion. Well done to your team. Um, this one says, good evening, Salam. I'm quite curious about what happens to our secondary bond markets in the next few years, given the debt exchange and what will be the modalities for individual bondholders who have their bonds maturing from Ebony in New Hachimota. They will take that question up later. Good evening, Salam. I want to know from your guests whether the appreciation of the city is a temporary short-term gap measure. Uh, any assurance that the appreciation will continue for this man, this name? I think he said that. He said we will see better days. Um, Salam, great discussion. I'm only sad that this nation cannot survive on its own for at least four years. We always run to the IMF for a bailout. Every government hands the nation over to IMF before leaving office for the next government to face their conditionality from Philip Mensah and Goma Potin. Um, Dr. Mavamusa says, Salam, you have assembled technocrats that give everyone in the West African region hope on the economy, on Ghana's economy. That is great. We are watching from Nigeria and they have done a great work. The SLA is commendable thanks to the Bank of Ghana and the Ministry of Finance. Well, so that's how we conclude to this edition of the program. It's in a program of technocrats and experts. Um, Dr. Philip uh, Abredu Otu, the Director of Research at the Bank of Ghana. Dr. Al Hassan Idrisu, is the director for economic strategy and research division at the, at the finance ministry and samuel akes minister of and director of debt is the director of treasury and debt management division of the ministry of finance my name is salam adunu i'm starting for a regular host bernard Avle. have a good evening